Okay, so we're recording. All right, well, let's turn to Ephesians 3. Ephesians. We are no longer, and I was thinking about this this week. This is one where everyone needs to get some popcorn and their favorite beverage and get comfortable because we're going to be in here for a while. There's a, there's a lot here, you know, and, and uh, well, there's, there's a lot to look at. So I think it'll, it'll be fun as we go through this. Um, so we'll spend some time the first little bit, of course, just looking at the, the dispensational aspects of it, because that's really what he lays out here in Ephesians 3, is the mystery that's revealed to him. This is where we see it called, specifically the mystery. But we find out a lot about how it was revealed and when it was revealed and to whom it was revealed here. And we'll spend some time looking on all those things. So the last time we were together, we finished. In fact, well, let's let's start and let's read. Let's read chapter three. I don't know. Yeah, we'll. Uh, so chapter three and verse one. For this cause, I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and who make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So I will stop there, because we will not get nine verses in tonight. But so like I said, last time we did in fact finish up chapter two, and we spent two weeks really looking at who those prophets, uh, the prophets and the apostles were, we, that our foundation is built on. We saw that it's not the Old Testament prophets. And we spent some time on that because when we get to chapter 3, that issue is going to come up again. And if we already have it settled, then we can, then it'll allow us to understand some things he talks about in 3 a little a little easier. We, we saw that those, those prophets, and we spent most of the time last time talking about the prophets, and those prophets were the people in the local assembly that... Um, when a, when a letter would come in, when a epistle would come in, they would declare that that is scripture, that is not. And, you know, we looked at the, the letter to the Laodiceans, which we don't have. There's two epistles in the Corinthians that are referenced that we don't have. And it's not that we're missing some some letters. It's not that our Bible isn't complete. It's that those were not scripture. There might have been good doctrine in it, but they didn't rise to the level of scripture. The prophets also would have kept the, the scriptures, and, you know, and they would have been the scribes when the letters got disseminated out to people, the, the prophet would have been the one in there making the copies. He would have been, you know, supernaturally making sure he had authentic copies. And we'll look at some of that too, how they how they were able to maintain and make sure that they were true copies. And again, that becomes an issue again in chapter 3. Um, like I say, we, we, they were kind of in charge of the lending library at the local church, if you will. People wanted to come in and they wanted to, to see what Paul had written to them or to the Church of the Laodiceans. It, then they could go and they could say, hey, I want to check this out, or I want to, however they would do it, they could go and they could read them for themselves. And it's very important, too, that you read for yourself. Um, you know, it, it's very important to be taught. It's very important to listen. It's also very important to read it's over and over and over again throughout the Bible, regardless of the dispensation, you're told read, read, read. And well, well it's, it's interesting I listened. I just happened to listen to Richard on talk about this today, but his teaching was from two weeks ago, and he he brought up this issue of reading. He went to the Old Testament. We'll look at some of the places in the New Testament, but consistently the issue is for ourselves to get into this book and read it for ourselves and read it daily, and, and let then let the Holy Spirit do His thing. Um, so then one more thing on these prophets, like when all these copies were around, that's how one way that they could tell. That they could maintain the fidelity, if you would, of the written word at the time. As there were these different copies, as they came across a prophet's desk, he could compare a copy to a known, a known good source, and compare the the one that he just received. And if they matched, he knew that it was it was authentic and that it was reliable. And that's how God has preserved His word throughout time. 
is through a multiplicity of copies. So that when error came in, it was really easy to see, well, these manuscripts don't look like that, but that one does, so this one must be, there must be some error in that. Now, they had the advantage back then. They were working off the originals or very close to the, to the originals. Whereas, and that's what has happened. I'm going to a place I don't want to go, but at, down through the ages now, then all of a sudden everybody says, well, we want to go back to the oldest manuscripts. It's a huge doctrine, but today, a lot of the oldest manuscripts may or may not be the best. There's more to it than that, but because we have 2,000 years. They, I mean, the, the, the guy, the prophet in Ephesus, he had Paul's original. He had the original letter to the Ephesians. And so when the copies were made, when the copies would come back or whatever, he, everybody could compare them and make sure that they were what it said. That's not our lesson, so we'll move on from that. So anyhow, we saw also in verses 21 and 22 that we are a building fitly framed together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, and we are a habitation of God through the Spirit. We saw that like Solomon built that temple with fitly framed stones that were built off-site, and they fit because they were complete and they were perfect. So are we. We are in Christ. We are complete and we are perfect, and we are fitly framed to be used for God's purpose as we get built in that holy temple. And then we're also support that fitly framed also has the issue in it, the connotation in it of supporting each other. Just like, you know, in the example we use was a building. The first floor supports the second floor and the roof keeps everybody dry and the walls keep the wind out. Everybody is, every member of the body of Christ is there to support the other body of Christ and to rejoice when they rejoice and to comfort them when somebody is suffering. So that got us to the end of chapter 2. So now as we move into chapter 3, Paul's going to lay out the mystery. And he says, so that we can understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul's purpose in chapter 3 is just exactly that, that we'll understand Paul's knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And you can see that in verse 3, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Um, and then you look down at verse 18, the, the, the point of knowing, his, of understanding his knowledge is that in verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ. That breadth and length and depth and height, that's of the mystery, of the body of Christ. And we're going to look at, we're going to get in, we're going to take a look, well, not tonight, but when we get down to verse 18, we're going to look at what exactly is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and it'll be exciting. And, and then we'll, and we'll spend some time looking at the love of Christ. But as again, as we go in, Paul is just laying these things out. It's Paul's writings, right, that edify us today, that get us built up, built up into that holy temple, that habitation of God through the Spirit. So if you were to outline chapter 3 real quick, he, he defends that the mysteries came to him in the first few verses. In verse 6, he tells you what the mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same bodies and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now when we get down there, we'll spend some time there and we'll take a look at that and all the doctrines that involve that issue. There's a lot that involves those things. And then when you go down from there and you go in verses 8 and 11, he's going to explain, well, why do we want to understand that? What, what is the point of understanding? And we'll see. It's to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And that we're putting something on display to the angels. So we have a purpose there. And then the end of the chapter, of course, that's going to be, well, now that you do understand it, this should be the result of that understanding. And this is, this will be, okay, now that, now that I've explained this, and now that you see how it work, how it's designed to work, this is how it should work out in you. And, and then you can take it out to, to the other people and explain it to them. One thing as I looked at this chapter, though, there's a definite change in Paul's attitude through this chapter. So I just want to speed read through it real quick and, and look at when Paul's going to talk about himself. So in verse 1, and this has to do with the Revelation too, but, but just look at Paul's attitude here. Chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, verse 2, which is given me, verse 3, by how, how that by revelation he made known unto me, as I wrote, verse 4, my knowledge, verse 7, I was made a minister, verse 7, given unto me, verse 8, unto me is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. That's really the last time he says anything noteworthy of himself and talks about 
meek, if you will. He, he makes a reference to himself in a couple of verses later, but it's in his humility. But from this point forward, and actually from verse uh, 5 on, he changes it. And now it all becomes, so you, you get the revelation of the mystery by through Paul, but then it becomes what God does. So in verse 5, he talks about it's revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. But then in 9, it's hid in God who created all things. Verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God. Verse 11, the purpose which he purposed. Verse 12, Jesus Christ, in whom we have boldness. Verse 15, the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, by his Spirit. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell, that you may know the love of Christ. Verse 19 now, be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding according to the power that worketh in us. And then verse 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. I just find it it's so fascinating to me when I when you start this chapter, it's all about, and he's not being arrogant. He's making, I understand he's making a point. But the attitude is he starts out, I, Paul, I, Paul, me, me, me. And then it switches. And then, okay, now that you've got the mystery, let me tell you about it. It's about God. It's about Jesus Christ. It's by his spirit. It's about God. It's not about men. It's about God and about what God can do, and about the plan that God had from the beginning of time. And we'll develop that more as we go on. But the, the I, I don't even know how I came across it, but I, I was reading it, and it just struck me that all of a sudden I'm reading about Paul, and then I'm not reading about Paul anymore. I'm reading about God. And that kind of has to do with this issue where he talks about being a prisoner. We'll get to that in a little bit. But you see, it starts off, and the very first thing he says is in chapter... 3 verse 1 for this cause I Paul well what is the cause the cause is the cause he was talking about in chapter 2 that dispensational change that he just spoke of and is now going to explain that in more detail it's through Paul that we find out that Lord Jesus Christ has quickened us that he's broken down that middle wall of partition um, and that he's made us of the household of God to declare that is why Paul was made the apostle of the Gentiles that was his job that was, that was the, the, the reason that Jesus Christ raised him up to the apostles of the Gentiles was to declare those things to the Gentiles. Again, we just looked at it. He goes over and over. It was given to me. I'm the apostle. This grace is given to me. He's very clear. It, it's amazing to me as I read through this chapter the confusion that is there today about him teaching the same thing as everybody else taught because he is so clear. Paul, Paul's not ambiguous on this point. Every time that I can think of in any of his books where he talks about his apostleship or what's been revealed to him or what he has told other people, he's been very clear about it. it, it it's not like, and even when he, he, he makes the comment, I didn't even get this from men. So we, you can, because I know there are people that think when he went up to uh, Jerusalem that that's when he got all this stuff. But he's been very clear about it. The word is very clear about that. Paul understood. It was revealed to Paul, but it's about God. It's about Jesus Christ. He understood it wasn't about him, the man. It was about his office, right? Romans eleven thirteen. I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify not me, but my office. That office was what was the important thing. He happened to fill that office. Because he understood that the gospel wasn't about him, and, and, but it was about the Lord Jesus Christ, he was able to call himself the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to spend a good portion of time look at, looking at that issue in a moment here. He was the uh, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He had all these great revelations revealed to him. He held this office, you know, this office that he declares, "I magnify my office." And yet, and he and the reason he was put in that office was to, was to declare the mystery. Yet, when he's going to come down and he's going to give the, his great treatise, if you will, on what the mystery is, he doesn't claim to be the apostle claims to be a prisoner. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't go to the place of valor, if you will. He goes to the place of very humility when he goes to, de to declare all, all of this. He was the apostle of the Gentiles. He received a multitude of revelations directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He spent time in, in Arabia. Um, 
he, we are told that the things that he writes are the commandments of God. He states that he's fought the good fight, he's finished his course, he's kept the faith, and because of that there's a crown of righteousness laid up for him. Yet when he puts pen to paper to tell us about the mystery, he says, I'm a prisoner. And it's just fascinating to me, and it leaves an impression with me that that his his signature, I mean, if he had a business card to say, Paul, Apostle of the Gentiles, Revealer of the Mystery. But he didn't have that. His business, Paul's business card was said, Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And it's it's amazing. You know, my, my business card for my business, it's got, all, it's, got all, it's got some things on it that tell everybody that gets my card how great I am. And I think my business card even says something about being an expert on it. But, <laughs> but Paul's doesn't. Paul's said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know, even today, and he, he, he talks to Timothy about, don't be embarrassed of it. Even today, I was thinking about this. We talk about, we often talk about Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, the due time testifier. We say, Paul, to whom the risen Lord Jesus Christ revealed the mystery. We don't often say, I follow Paul the prisoner. Even today, there's just, of all the things that we can declare that we follow Paul for, that's probably not the one we pick. You know, we, we go over to 1 Corinthians, we go, you know, well, we follow Paul because he followed Jesus. You ever say, I follow Paul because he was a prisoner? And you don't. But we'll, we'll look into that. It's, and, and we don't, like I said, we're very, Paul, very proud of Paul our apostle. Maybe not quite so proud of Paul the prisoner. And like I said, the due time testifier of God's grace, of the hope of eternal life, he, he identifies himself as, as that prisoner. Like I said, even to Timothy, you know, Timothy and, and his quiet moments, so probably not as quiet so much, but towards the end of Paul's life, Timothy was starting to have some doubts and maybe starting to, because starting to feel some shame about, man, this man that I followed and that I built my ministry around, all of a sudden he's a prisoner now. And Paul had to cheer him up. And that's another thing. When Paul's in prison, he's the cheerleader for other people. It, it, a study in Paul the man is a fascinating thing to watch to watch his spiritual growth, if you will. Because you can you can see it in the scriptures if you look through it. And some of the things and then how he changes. So he says he's the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ for you, for us Gentiles. He doesn't say he's the prisoner of Rome for Jesus Christ, which is in fact what he is. Look over at chapter 6. He's in jail in Rome. Uh, chapter 6, verse 18. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now we're going to see that he did in fact speak boldly, even in his prison. But he also claims here to be an ambassador in bonds. You know, ambassadors aren't supposed to go to jail. They have, right. they have diplomatic immunity. That shows you the complete rebellion of the world to God today. We don't honor God's ambassadors. Now, that's us. But in, at the time here, Paul was, I mean, ambassadors don't go to jail. They might get kicked out of the country, but they don't go to jail. Well, Paul is in, and he is right what he says, you know. The mystery, at the end of 19, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. He understood why he was in jail. He was in jail because he was an ambassador. He was out preaching what Jesus Christ told him to preach. But when he talks about who he's a prisoner to, he doesn't talk about being a prisoner to Rome. He talks about being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ for us Gentiles. And it's an interesting thing. Look over at 2 Corinthians, 5, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 
the love of Christ constraineth us. That issue of constraining is, is to, to hold you back, not allow you to go where you want to go, not have maybe some of the freedoms, or the, not have, be able to willy-nilly do whatever you, the desire you want to have. Now, if you, if you look at, come over and look at Acts 28. In a physical sense, he had been constrained. Acts 28 and verse 29. And when he had said these words, the Jews, do, well, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation is God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Roman constrained him to that hired house. He was in that house for two years with no freedom to go. I've heard some accounts of what it was like for Paul. Paul was literally chained either to the house or to a Roman centurion all the time. Now, he, had the, he wasn't in, in the catacombs in a jail, but he was at that house for two years, and he was constrained. He couldn't go anywhere. But when he talks about what constrains him, it's the love of Christ. Again, he understands who he is a prisoner for, and he understands what is constraining him. And he's not caught up in the things of the, this world. He's in jail with the Romans, and they're constraining him from doing what he wants to do. He said, no, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ, and it's the love of Christ that constrains me. No matter what was going on on earth, in his physical situation, he understood, every, he understood who his Lord was. He understood who he believed. He understood how that motivated his life. That issue of the love of Christ constraining us, that, that's that motivation. And you go through all that Paul went through in his life, and he can get to this point where he says, the love of Christ constraineth me. We'll look at some things. i got to think there were some times when Paul was thinking, God doesn't love me. But he never says that. He says just the opposite. He says, nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ. Here he says, it's the love of Christ, Christ that constraineth us. Uh, look over at Philippians 1. Philippians 1. You know, the other thing about that too is Paul being a Roman citizen did not have to go to Rome. He did not have to go to jail. He, when he was with a, If he hadn't appealed to Rome, he would have been let free. You know, he was getting beat, and he said, hey, are you supposed to beat a Roman, a Roman citizen? And they said, oh, well, we'll let you go. He said, no, no, you beat me publicly now. Now I want to go. And later, King Agrippa says, you know, if he, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, he'd be a free man. He knew his ticket to Rome was through the Romans, the, the Romans, if you will. Again, being that prisoner of Jesus Christ, he did the Lord's will, not his own. He could have said, you know what, you told me once not to go... Not, you, know, you told me not to go there. Those guys want me. They're going to put me in jail. I'm not going to have the freedom that I have here in Asia. I really like it over here. The weather's better. He said, no. That's what the Lord wants. That's where we're going. Look at Philippians. What did I say? Philippians 1, verse 12. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, uh, verse 11, unto the glory and praise of God. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifold in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren of the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He understood that he that all everything that happened to him, God was using to promote the gospel. For one, if Paul doesn't go to prison, we don't have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I'm missing one. And uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, well, Philemon for one too. Yeah. But you don't have we for sure we don't, we, we don't have the so-called prison epistles if he doesn't go to jail. But he says here in verse 13, so that remember we we read about that issue that he wanted people to pray for him that he would speak boldly as he ought to speak. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifold, are manifest in all the palace. So 
Before he went to that hired house, he would have been in the dungeon in Caesar's palace, if you will. That's where he is. And you can see, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the place. People know why he's there, and he's leaving a testimony to it. Look what, if you look over at uh, verse 22. Um, I think I missed one here. Oh, right. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 22. I'm sorry. Philippians 4, verse 22. Verse 21. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So you know he he, he gets he gets he's writing this from Rome, obviously. You know he goes to jail in Rome. He goes he gets put in that dungeon in Caesar Caesar's house, and he's all of a sudden now he is speaking boldly, and he's getting people in Caesar's very household mm -hmm. saved. Well, that's pretty amazing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. He is speaking bold. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He understands the power of salvation of the Jew and Gentile. Right in the, the the very guys that put that guy with that should have had diplomatic community in jail, he says, "Okay, no problem. Watch this, Caesar. I'm going to get your own people saved," and he does it. You see how the things that happened to him worked out for the furtherance of the gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why he says, "I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ." He didn't say, "I'm the prisoner of Rome." That was inconsequential to him. He was the prisoner of Jesus Christ for us Gentiles. Paul's the prisoner of Je the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constraining him. He's the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the gospel that was committed unto him. And we see how he takes some stuff. He was not really given a choice. He was, in fact, a prisoner. And we'll look at that. Let's look at um, look at 2 Timothy 1. I have some serious doubts if we're ever going to get out of chapter 3. No. <laughs> <laughs> 2 Timothy 1. And we are going to come back here in a little bit. But 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. Verse 7. Verse 4. <laughs> Paul's writing to Timothy. As Timothy is... Is not is feeling down. I just put it that way. He's some you know things in Asia, which where he's in charge of, are not going well. Right, all everybody's in Asia's left. Is what Paul says. Well, you know Timothy's going around. He's setting up all those churches, and you see the church goes into great apostasy at this time. So Paul writes to Timothy and he says in verse four, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that I'll stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you saw that over in Philippians with what was going on in Caesar's house. Verse 8 of Timothy, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's tough to stop when you read Paul because you're always in the middle of a thought, you know. Um, what I want you to see here, though, is he, here he identifies himself again as a prisoner of the Lord. He, right? In verse 8, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. And he's telling, he's telling Timothy, this is what's going to happen. You are going to suffer afflictions. So be a partaker. But but don't be ashamed of them. Because like I told the Philippians, everything that's happened to me has happened for the furtherance of the gospel. And that, that's what that gospel is. It's the according to the power of God who has saved us. He's reminding him of what the gospel is and what the power of the gospel is 
and that while it's very easy to be ashamed of them, he shouldn't be, because that, in fact, is where the power is. The power is in the gospel. It's not in Paul. The, the power is not in Paul. The power is not even in Paul's office. The power is in Jesus Christ and the gospel. Look over at 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians verse nine and verse fifteen. Nine verse fifteen. But I have used none of these things. Fourteen. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. This little section here is so upside down to how the world thinks today, even in the Christian community. And it is absolutely, it, it, when, I, when I read this, I just, it, it shocked me what, what Paul's saying here. Paul's a prisoner of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ put this obligation on him. And we're going to go look in, in Romans in a second, look at that obligation. But if he preaches the gospel, he's got nothing to glory of. Because that, that, that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do. It says um, in verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. This is why he was called. There's nothing. It's not like he discovered some great thing. It was revealed to him. That's why, that, that's why he was saved on the road to, to Damascus. God saved him. Jesus saved him so that he could, in fact, do this. This is his job. So he doesn't get to glory and say, look at me and look how great my conversion was and how I saw the light and how wonderful it was and I, I went and searched the Old Testament prophets and found this great thing and let me reveal it to you. He says, no, this burden was put on me. I, I don't have any reason to glory. And then he says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. So if I don't, and then he says, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, you notice he doesn't say, if I don't do it. He says, if I, it, he doesn't, in verse six, 16, you say, I don't have any choice. Necessity is laid upon me. I have to do it. Now, if I don't, woe is to me. He's thinking he's going to get a zap, right? But in verse 17, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if I do it against my will, well, the dispensation of the gospel has still been committed to me. You see, a lot of times you read that and you say, well, if I do it willingly, I have a reward. But if I do it not, if I don't do it, but that's not what he says. He said he's going to do it regardless because necessity has been laid on him because he's the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Then in 18, he talks about, okay, well, then what is my reward? And here's his great reward. If he does what he's supposed to do, he gets to do it for free. <laughs> okay. I'm going to travel around. I'm going to be, I'm going to give up all the riches that I had, probably give up his family. I'm going to travel around. I'm going to get stone literally to death probably at one point. I'm not going to be able to see. I'm going to have to have people write for me. I'm going to get chased out of most towns. I'm going to be in several shipwrecks. And I'm not going to get rich. He's, you know, he, he still had to make his own tents. And or he, had to, he was a tent maker. He had to make tents and sell them. It, it's just an amazing passage here. He understands what it means to be a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just be a servant. He's not, he's not Onesimus. He's a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. For us. For us. Look over at Romans 1. Romans 1 and verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So he's covered the whole world there. That's the way everybody looked at the world at the time. He was obligated to preach the gospel of grace. When he says he's a debtor, that was his obligation. It was his obligation to preach the gospel of grace. Verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome 
also. Verse 15, verse 14 is that obligation. He's like, I got an obligation to do it. And now he says in verse 15, and now I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to pay that, to, to, to fulfill that obligation, to that, that, that debt that I have there. I'm ready to fulfill it. My obligation is to come preach the gospel of grace. I'm ready to do it. I understand what my role is. I'm going to write you this letter, but my desire is to come see you because as the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to come and impart something to you. Some spiritual gift, he says earlier in, in, in the book. He understood his role, and he understood what it meant to be a prisoner. It, that's why he, he talks about bringing every thought into the captivity of Jesus Christ. Not captive to Jesus Christ, but he was to have the same thoughts that Jesus Christ did because he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He understood it was the love of Christ that constrained him and that everything that happened in the gospel had happened, or to him, had happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Look over at Acts, oh yeah, look over at Acts 9. We kind of took this tour backwards. But I wanted you to see throughout his ministry he's talking about being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ and that, that understanding that everything he did was because something had been laid upon him at the very beginning. He's out there with arrest warrants to take the Jews, the believing Jews and throw them in jail. And all of a sudden now he's out there saying Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, is bringing grace to the world. And again, it, he had nothing to glory of in that. So look at Acts 9. I'm sure Jocelyn knows what happens in Acts 9. Yeah. What? <laughs> the Lord of Damascus is, is, yeah, what's the general? Okay. <laughs> so verse 10. So he has been on the road to Damascus. The Lord Jesus Christ has appeared to him. He's been blind. He gets taken now. Now he's, he's, he's in Damascus. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. I had never caught this before. Isn't it interesting, though, that he's in the house of someone named Judas? Yeah. I mean, I know that yeah. not not every Judas is a Judas. And Judas, Judas is it's actually the, the Greek way of saying Judas. But it's interesting that this chief of sinners goes to the house of Judas. It's a different Judas, but it goes, anyhow. Uh, Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests, priests to bind all that call on thy name. In verse 14, what's Paul doing? He's making others prisoner. See how, see how the thing has changed? Yeah, it's flip-flop. He's out making people with authority. He's got, uh, I don't know, I guess in the, in, they weren't from Rome, but they were from the Jewish leaders. He, and there was that, that dual law thing going there. But yeah, he had the legal authority from the Jewish leaders to take Jews that believed that Jesus was the Son of God and their Messiah and put them, in, put them in jail, make them prisoners. Prisoners of the religious system. 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Well, that's okay. That sounds pretty good. But keep reading. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, Paul was obligated to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he suffered because of that obligation, and because he was that prisoner, and because he did what Jesus Christ said to do. But from the very beginning, Jesus told an Ananias, I'm going to show him how many things he's got to suffer for me. From the very beginning, there was an issue with Paul that he was going to suffer great things. Not just the ordinary suffering that we all go through because we live in the sin curse. Well, he suffered great things. And he did it all the way to the end, it, it appears. Paul, again, understood. Come back, go back to 2 Timothy 4. Lord Jesus Christ chose Paul 
to preach the gospel, to teach the mystery, and to suffer great things for him. Second Timothy 4 and verse 6. This is what he says at the end. He doesn't, Paul does not have the attitude at the end of his life, of all that he's gone through, of a bitter man, of a, of a bitter, resentful guy. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. Paul did get that reward that he was talking about. Remember he said it, there is a reward waiting for me if I do this thing willingly? He got that reward. There's a crown of righteousness laid up for him, and he knows it, and he's counting on it. And, you know, he describes, he, as he describes the Lord, who he's been a prisoner to, the righteous judge. It's, it's an amazing title. It, it, it's, it's a judicial title, right? You'd be a prisoner. A judge would make you a prisoner. He says not, you know, he's a righteous judge. He doesn't, he's not bitter at, at the end of his life. In fact, he's never bitter. Um, look back at 1 Corinthians 9 again. I should have told you to stay there. I'm sorry. Yeah, look back at 1 Corinthians 9. What verse? 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. Mm, verse, <laughs> we'll back up a couple of verses. Uh, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain? And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. You know, he just talked about that crown of righteousness. We looked at the second Timothy. He understood that crown. He fought the fight. He finished his course. When you run, when you run a race, you follow, you're supposed to follow a course. I think I told you, I actually, and you know, when you go to a race, right, you, before a race starts, they, they give you the instructions. And I, I always make the joke, oh, I don't need to pay attention, I'll follow the guy in front of me. Well, I went out, there were two races going at the same time, one was a 5K, one was a 10K, or whatever it was, and me and my buddy were running two different races, and, and when you'd go out, and then the guys doing the short race would come back. And so I get out halfway, and it's time to turn around, and they say, okay, if you're on the short race, turn around. And I look at my buddy, and I go, there's nobody ahead of me. And I was the first one, I actually won a race once. And it was so scary. I didn't know where I was supposed to go. I didn't pay attention. You, you figured there'd be somebody in front of you, you know. But I, you, and he's exactly right. You, you win. I, we didn't win crowns. It was a little the medallion. But it's corruptible. But Paul understood. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I followed the course. I finished my course. I knew where I was going. I knew who I believed. And I didn't do it for a corruptible crown. I did it for an incorruptible crown of righteousness that the righteous judge has given me. Think about all that Paul did in his life before the road to Damascus. He didn't deserve an incorruptible crown given to him by a righteous judge. Righteous judge should have said, There'll be you can, you're gonna be wailing and gnashing your teeth for the rest of eternity. It's amazing, like I said, you see you see Paul's attitude. This obligation was laid upon him. He was the prisoner of Jesus Christ, and he was never bitter. You never get bitter in it. You you, you see some despair in his writing sometimes, but you never see bitterness. He never says, this isn't worth it. He says, actually, just, just the opposite. Um, that incorruptible crown of righteousness. So I want to look at a couple of more things. Than, uh, where are we at time-wise? We're at 44 right now. Okay. Well, I think we'll look at a couple more things, and then I want, then I want to get at some dispensational issues, but I think we'll save that for next week. But uh, let's, again, maybe we can go look at a few more verses that talk about, about the, the heart that Paul had being the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Um, so these are all in Timothy, so let's go back, sorry about that, let's go back to 2 Timothy, this time, 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy 3 and verse 10. So he's talked about, all. We, we've seen several verses where he's talked about all the things that have happened to him, so he, he's going to tell us some of those things right now. 
Verse 10, But that was fully known, my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delib delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You ever read verse 11 and go, how could he possibly think God delivered him out of those things? But he did. You know, he, he all those things that Paul went through, he's not focused on what he went through. He's focusing on the deliverance that came from those things. And sometimes it wasn't physical deliverance. I mean, eventually he did physically get delivered out of them. But he went through a lot of things. I mean, we just read he was in prison in, Paul, in Rome for two years. But he was still working. He was still, he still, again, he didn't get caught up in what was happening to him. He was caught up in the Lord Jesus Christ and what was happening with the gospel because of what was happening to him. He wasn't bitter about those things. It, it's fascinating to me that he says, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. I get a little hangy on. I go, hey, what's this about? You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an amazing adage. I have a, I, I wrote a note. Paul was not focused on the problems, but he was focused on the deliverance, and he was focused on where the deliverance came from. The deliverance didn't come from the courts releasing him. The deliverance came from the Lord Jesus Christ. He Paul he prayed, uh, you know, over in when he did our Philemon study, we saw that. He made that prayer, and he wanted Philemon to pray that when I'm delivered, that I can come unto you. Philemon, he didn't think Philemon delivered him. He thought the Lord, out of all those things he just listed there, it was the Lord that delivered me. Uh, I, and I think what we'll do, I think I will do a takeoff in our uh, conference in, in March. I think I will do a takeoff of what we just watched in California, saw in California. And one of the lessons that John did, which was really good, was about deliverance from what to what and we'll take a look at that and oh this will probably be one of the verses we, we look at because how does the lord how did the lord deliver paul out of those things so often in our mind it wasn't an immediate physical deliverance but it would have been a a calming of the heart and an understanding and a reminding paul that hey this is all happening so that the gospel the to the furtherance of the gospel oh and by the way this is why you have the office of the boss of the Gentile. How do you like that office now, Paul? You know. All right. We're going to come right back to 2 Timothy, but first go to 1 Timothy. Verse 8. What chapter? Uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 8. Verse 8, 1 Timothy 1, verse 8. I really want uh, 11 and 12, but we'll pick it up in 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murder, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into this ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in, a, which is in Christ Jesus. I think, verse 12, I think Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul's ministry was one of physical torment. Paul was consistently in fear of death, in fear of injury, in fear of prison. And yet, he, told, he just says, I thank Christ Jesus that he put me into this ministry. It doesn't say... I thank Christ Jesus that I got to preach the mystery that I could have done without the rest. Because it, it, Paul understands, we, we've seen the verses tonight. They're one, in Paul's case, they're one and the same. 
Paul, at the very beginning, Paul, Jesus told Ananias, I'm going to show him what great things he must suffer for me. Well, he's at the end here. He has suffered those great things. And his comment is, I think Christ Jesus will put me into this ministry. That's an amazing heart. So it's, it's for 30 years, 40 years, however long Paul's ministry was, given up all that he had. He was at the top of his profession. Gave it all up. And he gets down at the end and says, Oh, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Let's look back at 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1. Verse 8 again. First Timothy 1, verse 8, but we already read that. So we're going to pick it up in verse 9. The second half of verse 8. But, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath fright brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the sound, the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, he goes through. He says, you know what? I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. He's not ashamed of... I, you can go if, if you go... if you ever read his... I did this one time. From beginning to end of Paul's epistles, and only really focusing on the physical things regarding Paul and his body, you come to the conclusion at the end, he was not much. He was probably a broken down, hobbled old man that couldn't see... Probably had a lot of scars, maybe some bumps all over his and Fred Flintstone bumps all over his head from, from some things that have happened. You know, you, you know he was malnourished at times in his life. He probably didn't wasn't real proud of the way he looked. And I know that's not his point here. But he never talks about it. He talks about Timothy, don't be ashamed of me. I'm not ashamed. I'm the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, but that's okay because I've suffered all these things for the furtherance of the gospel. Oh, and by the way, it's not about me or Apollos or Cephas. It's about the gospel. It's about everything. Some of these guys, and he said earlier, we didn't look at it, but see, he says one of the passages we looked at earlier, if we'd read a little further, you'd go on and see, I'm in jail, and that means some other brothers, they're all popped up, and they're out preaching, trying to get credit for with me in jail now. But when I read that, I know there's some discussion about what happens in that passage, but when I look at that passage, Paul doesn't like the fact that they're taking credit, but he doesn't discourage what they're preaching. It seems that they are preaching the right thing, but they're trying to get credit for it. So there, there, is, there, there is that issue. But he even understands, even at then, still, the gospel is being preached. That's all Paul cared about. Preach the gospel. If i got to suffer, I suffer. I'm not ashamed. There's a crown of righteousness later for me. And it's incorruptible. I'm not the prisoner of Rome, guys. Yeah, I'm in jail in Rome and all this stuff's happening, but I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And I am not ashamed. You know, there's a lesson for us there. And I know it can be hard. It can be hard in high school. It can be hard at work. It can be hard at the dog track, I understand. Or the, not the dog. She doesn't go to a dog track. The dog walking park. I'll say PC. You know, to, to, to share that stuff. But boy, if Paul could do what he did, we can certainly do what we can do. Because it's no, it doesn't amount to what Paul did. Now, don't forget, when we started this, he was an ambassador in bonds. The world does not respect our ambassadorship. It put Paul in jail. It'll cert it won't in our country it won't put us in jail. In other parts of the world, it'll put it, put you in jail. But you don't have people don't look at you with any great respect. Probably they actually look at you with less respect. And that's a world problem. That's not a problem with being an ambassador. So don't be ashamed of the gospel of God or your role as an ambassador. Because everything that happens does work out 
to the furtherance of the gospel one way or the other. And April and I were talking this day. You never know when something that you, you may have a witness, a quiet witness to somebody you don't even know you've had, and somebody may it, may, it may get picked up and somebody else may do something with that. Somebody may say, you know, there's somebody at work and they act a certain way and they don't do this, they don't do that. And somebody else in their life might say, well, let me tell you why that person doesn't do this. And you may never may know about it. But wherever you are, you always have a gospel, a, a witness to give. And it might even be a very quiet witness. Don't ever be ashamed that you're saved. Don't ever be ashamed that you're an ambassador for Christ. Don't ever be ashamed. And I, I mean, I'm talking to myself. Don't ever be ashamed to share the gospel. Now, that, I, I do agree that there's a time and a place. Because you also want people to be receptive. Don't be ashamed of it. If Paul wasn't ashamed, and he's telling Timothy, don't be ashamed, well, we certainly shouldn't be ashamed. Because what we preach, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the power of God into salvation to the Jew and to the Gentile. It'll save everybody. But you got you, you they have to a witness has to be given to them. And that's that's our role as ambassadors, is to get over our embarrassment, get over our for our our um, our shame. And we're not don't be ashamed. And just, you know, take the risk. Tell somebody, you know, the, the greatest way to do it is, is, you know, you just ask them, and when the conversation comes up, has anybody ever cared enough about you to talk, talk to you about salvation? And let them, let them respond. You know, you'd be amazed how many people will come back and say, no, what do you mean? And there you go. Or if somebody, somebody attacks the Bible, you know, you know what I always, I always say, well, I didn't know about that, why don't you tell me about it? Now you just got yourself invited to do a Bible study. And, people, you know, how you can do it. The lesson today is, as Paul is, we are. We are prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul is. We shouldn't be ashamed, and we should we should revel, we should use our ambassadorship and put it into work every day. It should be part of our life every day. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We do thank you that we are ambassadors for you, Lord, and and I would pray that we wouldn't be ashamed, that we would go out with boldness, so that our prayers for ourselves and for others would be that we would speak boldly the, the gospel as we should, that we would proclaim that you are the Savior of all of mankind, Lord, if people will just simply put their faith in what you did on the cross, your shed blood of the cross, Lord, your death, burial, and resurrection. It was such a wonderful gift that we couldn't even it would never even occur to us to think of that as the plan for salvation, Lord. And we praise you for your wisdom in that, that you kept it a mystery as we're looking into it here. As we go down, continue on through Ephesians 3, I pray that it will be edifying to all of us, Lord. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Whew. Any questions, comments, concerns? I think Ricky made it into the frame a few times. That's okay. <laughs>